Our work is called uh, Plug and Play Diffusion Features uh, for Text Driven Image to Image Translation. Uh, okay. So our starting point, right? our starting point is that uh, text to image diffusion models are uh, incredible. They generate beautiful photos uh, given arbitrary prompts like this uh, panda surfing or uh, all these amazing examples that I'm sure you've all played with and seen before. Um, but they do have uh, one limitation, which is a uh, limited uh, user controllability. So let's say we start with a prompt, uh, a photo of a pink toy horse on the beach. Uh, we may get uh, multiple layouts uh, where the object is in different scales and locations in the image. And uh, it might be the case that none of these options is actually what the user had in mind to begin with. Uh, so a possible solution to this uh, would be to provide a guidance image uh, for the desired layout, uh, in addition to the text input. Uh, and so uh, we phrase this as uh, solving the task of uh, image to image uh, translation. Uh, where we want uh, given an uh, input image and a uh, um, target text, like a photo of a pink toy horse on the beach and uh, this uh, guidance image uh, to get an image that uh, satisfies uh, both the prompt and uh, retains the layout of this uh, guidance image. And uh, yeah, just like we see here uh, with this pink toy horse, uh, here are some more uh, cool examples, uh, results of our method. Uh, where you see we do have uh, accurate uh, structure preservation of the original source image while uh, completely changing the, um, changing it according to the target text. Um, okay, so we've, before we dive in, let's uh, have a quick recap on uh, diffusion models. Uh, so when we talk about diffusion models, we talk about a forward process and a backward process, uh, where the forward process is basically taking a clean image, x0, and uh, noising it according to some uh, known uh, uh, noising schedule. Uh, and this is the easy part. Uh, so as you know, the, the hard part is to start with a Gaussian noise image and then uh, turn it into a clean image uh, that looks realistic. Uh, and uh, the problem is that uh, this uh, reverse uh, distribution is uh, untractable. So uh, what we do is uh, train the diffusion model uh, to approximate uh, this uh, reverse distribution. And then uh, to generate new images, we sample from this uh, learned uh, distribution. Uh, so let's talk about some other works uh, and what they've done uh, before us. Ever since we submitted this uh, paper, a lot of uh, other exciting works uh, tackled this uh, problem. But uh, when we worked on this, uh, a dominant uh, method uh, for controlling the generation was uh, SD edit. Uh, and what they propose is basically to take uh, a clean image that we want as uh, the guidance uh, for the layout and uh, noise it to some uh, intermediate uh, time step. And then a sample uh, with a new prompt uh, from that time step on. So uh, for different uh, uh, noising levels, we would get uh, different uh, the different edit basically. But as you can see, uh, there is a very inherent trade-off uh, of this method uh, between satisfying the target edit and preserving the layout. So uh, if we preserve the layout, we don't really fulfill the edit uh, and vice versa. Uh, our method uh, solves this trade-off, and we are able to uh, both uh, accurately preserve the structure and completely deviate uh, in the low frequencies and uh, fulfill the target edit, uh, which is the main uh, pitfall of uh, SC edit. Uh, another uh, dominant, uh, actually concurrent work to ours is uh, that of prompt to prompt, uh, where basically in their method, they use a, a generated guidance image, like this uh, cat riding a bicycle. Uh, and then to generate a new image with the same layout, they fix the interaction of the text uh, with the image inside the model uh, to obtain results such as this one, uh, where the bicycle is switched into a card. But uh, this method does have limited uh, structure preservation, as can be seen in this example. So um, the ducks kind of change and the street kind of changes, while our result here uh, shows accurate uh, structure preservation while also uh, fulfilling the edit. Uh, another pitfall of this uh, of prompt to prompt is that they require uh, uh, aligned source target prompts, and we can work with arbitrary uh, source target prompts. Uh, as as you will see, our method is not uh, really about the text interaction. Uh, lastly, another approach uh, for controlling the generation would be that taken by uh, make a scene, which is actually not a diffusion model, but in the context of uh, controlled generation, 
um, it's a relevant approach of just training a large scale generator uh, from scratch uh, to get um, input segmentation, another input channel. Uh, so here they took a segmentation mask uh, that uh, should um, give the layout of the um, desired image. Uh, but I think we all know what are the uh, pitfalls of uh, large scale training basically require a lot of uh, data, a lot of compute. Uh, not everyone has this, especially not in academia. <laughs> and uh, also in the end, uh, you're limited to the guidance domain uh, that the model was trained on. So if you trained on segmentation masks, you can only use segmentation masks to guide the generation. If you train on the edge maps or depth maps or so on, you, you're limited to that. Uh, well, our method can use various uh, guidance images, sketches, realistic images, and uh, arbitrary prompts. Okay, so once we've uh, covered uh, these main contributions, let's uh, see our approach. Um, the first question that we posed was, uh, how is semantic layout internally encoded uh, in the diffusion model? Uh, which feature maps or layers in the model are more uh, dominated by this uh, structure information. And then uh, once we gain some understanding of this, we want to ask how can we control uh, the structure in a new generation process? Uh, so let's uh, talk about the model that we uh, wanted to inspect. It is the stable diffusion, uh, the open source uh, text to image diffusion model that uh, I guess everyone uses. Um, uh, its input is a uh, Gaussian noise and uh, an input text. Uh, and the architecture is that of a unit, which means it has uh, downsampling and upsampling blocks uh, with steep connections between them. Uh, and each one of these layers uh, in the unit has a resonant block, a self attention block, and then a cross attention block uh, where the text uh, interacts with the generated image. Uh, and since we wanted to ask which feature maps uh, in the model are more dominated by the structure information, uh, what we started by was uh, to sample an image and extract these feature maps activations from the model. Uh, we did this also to real images uh, using uh, an inversion technique, uh, DDM inversion. Uh, so I'm not, I will not go into that now. Um, so what we did was to extract these uh, features uh, from a small data sets uh, of images uh, that share uh, semantic parts like uh, these uh, human figures here. And we did this for every time step of the generation, for every layer, for every block. It's uh, a lot of feature maps to look at. And um, so for each block and time step, uh, we took uh, the feature maps from all the images and we PCA them together uh, in order to understand, to gain some understanding of the visual properties that are dominating this really high dimensional uh, feature space. Um, so what we found when doing this on uh, several uh, small data sets, as, as you can see here, like uh, the animals that share semantic parts or the human figures or the instruments, what we found was that in a specific uh, layer in the decoder of the unit, uh, the semantic parts uh, or the parts of the objects are clustered uh, together in the same color. So uh, if we focus on the animal example here, uh, you see that the uh, head of the giraffe is clustered with the other heads and the legs are clustered nicely together. And this basically means that the most dominant uh, information uh, in this, uh, in this uh, layer is, the, is what we were looking for, which is the, the semantic layout, the semantic structure uh, of the image. And uh, we were very uh, happy to uh, to see that because um, this is what we were looking for. Uh, it's important to note that, uh, as I said, we did this for all of the layers in the model. It's a huge model with a lot of um, layers and blocks. And this was not the case for uh, for other layers. So if we take a look at the um, at the later layer in the decoder, you see that it's more dominated by uh, high frequency information. Or uh, in this layer, it looks like it's more dominated by uh, edges. Uh, where in the um, in in this decoder layer, you see that the hands are clustered together, the arms are clustered together, and so on. Uh, so now I'm going to pass the microphone to Nalek to explain what we did with this insight. Okay. Um, okay. So um, 
now, since we understand how uh, semantic layout information is uh, encoded into the diffusion model, now we pass to um, answering the question, how can we control the structure, the semantic layout during the generation? So uh, we have an input image, IJ, which is uh, kind of describing the desired structure that we want. And we have an input prompt, a photo of a silver robot in the snow um, that we want the final image to comply to. Uh, so what we can do is we can first uh, invert the input image to find the latent noise uh, that will reconstruct this image in the uh, DDM, uh, in the diffusion model sampling. And we can initiate another uh, generation process where we use the same um, latent noise and uh, the target prompt. And since we know from the insights that Michal showed, that um, the, uh, the features, the spatial features in this coarse uh, decoder block is dominated by the semantic layout information, what we can do is we can take uh, the feature that was obtained during the generation of the, uh, of the desired structure image and simply um, replace uh, the same feature in the target generation with, our, uh, with the feature that is dominated by the, by our desired structure information, and so we control the structure information in this coarse decoder block, and uh, to to get an image uh, such as this one. But if we do this experiment, we can see that um, just by doing this uh, simple feature injection does not result in uh, in the desired structure preservation, even though we know we know that it's uh, that it encodes this uh, desired structure. And so we turn to answering the question: Why? Why is this? Why does this occur uh, in our experiment? And so the first thing to notice is that um, even though these features are encoding the structure of the input image, they are very coarse in a coarse resolution. And but if we want to uh, generate an image in a high resolution, we should also be able to keep the structure details in also a higher resolution. And another reason is that if we look more carefully to the architecture, we can see that in the higher resolution blocks of the decoder, there are uh, lots of skip connections that are interfering uh, in, in the generation that can distort the structure that we initialize in the course of the resolution, such as the skip connections or, or the text that we're inputting through the cross attention uh, blocks. And so our solution will be to not only control the structure in a course resolution, but to also continue controlling it in all the higher resolutions of the decoder. And to do that, we re revisit the architecture of the diffusion model. And so specifically, res recall that decoder block consists of uh, three sub blocks, the ResNet block, the self-attention block, and the cross-attention block. And particularly, the, what we do in the self-attention block is given the input feature map, we linearly project it to values, squares, and keys. And we compute the self-attention map between queries and keys, which is basically the similarity of, of the query features to the key features. And eventually, we use the self-attention map to aggregate the values. And so we particularly concentrate on the self-attention map for structure preservation. And the reason is that the concept of self-attention is very closely related to the concept of self-similarity, because we're computing uh, self-affinities between spatial features. And uh, is there a question? Do we have a question now? Okay, maybe uh, maybe yeah. we'll answer in the end. Yeah, and and we know that self similarity both uh, it has been shown both in uh, in uh, classic words and in modern works that self similarity is uh, is an excellent uh, can serve as an excellent structure descriptor, and so this motivates us to consider self attention for uh, further structure pre preservation. Okay, so to visualize the self-attention in the diffusion model, what we do is basically given an image, we extract the self-attentions that are produced during its generation, and we apply um, principal component analysis to uh, reduce this dimensionality into three, and, and we visualize the leading three components as RGB channels. And so we can see from the visualizations that indeed the self-attention um, is aligned with the structure of the image, uh, particularly the coarser blocks are more aligned with the semantic layout because the head of uh, the boy and, and the doll and the legs and different semantic parts are clustered uh, similarly. And in higher resolutions, we see more higher frequency information, but uh, all the in all the resolutions, the self-attention maps aligns with the structure of the generated image. And so we revisit our pipeline of controlling the structure in the, in the, in the generation. And so, how we'll modify our framework is we will inject the features in a course resolution that are we know 
are dominated by the semantic layout information. And to preserve the structure in higher resolutions, we will inject the self-attention maps. And so intuitively, what we do in our framework is we initialize the structure in the course of resolution by injecting the features that we know in our encoding structure. And we keep this initialized semantic layout by injecting the self-affinities of the features in the higher resolutions. And so we see that indeed um, this modification of injecting the self-attention uh, in higher resolutions is uh, results in, uh, in a great structure preservation. And we're also able to comply with a target prompt. So now let's see some results of our method. Um, our method can handle, as we can see, uh, minimalistic structural guidance images, such as segmentations or silhouettes. Um, it can also handle multiple objects, such as this one. We can turn it into a photorealistic image of pairs or a polygonal illustration. Uh, and uh, the good thing is that we can also be creative in handling different types of like being, uh, being able to translate between very diverse classes, such as like stones to a skyscraper or stones to a wedding cake. Um, here's another example. Okay, so now let's do a little bit of ablation of our design choices. So uh, as we saw before, injecting only the course features are not enough for preserving the structure. And what happens if we inject the features and also the higher resolutions is that we it results in appearance and uh, high frequency information leakage from, from the guidance structure image, which is not what we desire because we want to be able to deviate from, from its appearance and uh, high frequencies. And here um, we see that if we only inject the self-attention, we can see it, it lacks the semantic initialization of the decoder features that we know are responsible for the semantic layout. Therefore, we result in a different structure. And only the final uh, setting of our framework is able to both satisfy the structure and the target prompt. OK, so now let's turn to numeric evaluation. So uh, for evaluation benchmarks, we had to create um, um, novel benchmarks because we're handling um, text-driven image translation in various image domains and prompts. And so there was no existing benchmark to really evaluate such a setting. And so we, we, we created a data set called wild TI2I, which consists of 148 text image pairs, both from uh, collected from the web, some real images, and both generated by stable diffusion. And we also have a data set called ImageNet R TI2I with 150 text image pairs. And this is based on, we collected a high quality images from the ImageNet R data set, and we created prompts using the renditions of ImageNet R. And regarding the metrics, so we use two complementary metrics for evaluating our performance. Uh, first, for evaluating how well we preserve the guidance structure, we use Dino Key's uh, self similarity between the guidance image and, and the translated image. Um, and to uh, evaluate how well we match the prompt, we use. Um, uh, simply a clip similarity score between the target prompt and, and our generated image to see how well we comply with the target prompt. And so uh, we evaluate our results on the image and our ti 2 benchmark. And what, what we can see from our uh, evaluation, from the quantitative evaluation, is that our method is able to both uh, have uh, a, a, a high text image similarity score, which is the x-axis, the higher the better, and it's also able to have a low structure distance score, which is the y-axis, so the lower the better because it's a distance uh, of structure. Uh, and so we can see that other methods either struggle in structure preservation, meaning that they have a low, they have a high structure distance, but a, a, a also high clip similarity, or the other way around, they're able to uh, preserve the structure, but as a result, they are um, um, they're not they're not matching matching the prompt. And intuitively, we can see that our method is kind of on par with SD edit with a very low uh, noising level in terms of structure preservation. And in terms of uh, prompt fidelity, it's in par with SD edit with a high uh, level noising. And if we repeat our evaluation in uh, other benchmarks, we can see that um, the same observations hold uh, also in other benchmarks.
Okay, so thank you very much for your attention. Uh, please visit our website, uh, pnpdiffusion.github.io for uh, more results, uh, more visualizations, and for code. And uh, for any one of you who's coming to CPR, please uh, visit our poster. Um, thank you. And it does look like you have one question in the Q&A. I think it came very early on uh, in the mm -hmm. presentation. Yeah, I missed it before, sorry. Uh... Can your approach be extended by including a portion of the image where the text is supposed to make a change? Uh, yes, uh, very good uh, question. Uh, it's not something that we incorporated into the uh, method uh, currently in this paper, but it can definitely be, I think, a lot of other works uh, that uh, um, follow the sim similar paths um, of uh, playing with the features of the diffusion model. Uh, did this kind of stuff where you uh, uh, use masks, basically. Uh, so I guess uh, our method could be uh, modified uh, where to, in a way, um, that you just inject uh, the features according to a mask, basically, or blend it somehow with, uh, um, with the original features or something like that. It's definitely um, should work. <laughs>